Okay, well, hello again, everybody. Um, in your bulletin, there's the little prayer note, prayer points taken from last Sunday's message. And um, I wanted to pray just for a moment, number three there. Today is Wednesday. There's six of these put out every week. And it's such a blessing to be able to pray right from the Bible. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later tonight. But let me read this to you and pray. Jesus will either confess us before the angels in heaven or he will not. It all depends on what we do with him down here while we are alive on this earth. Luke 12, 8 through 9. Also, I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him, the Son of Man, also will confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Father, we want to say thank you for those who have come to know you and have confessed you openly before men. However, we are concerned for those who have not. Father, you alone can bring conviction into their hearts and change their lives for eternity. Please move upon them soon, Lord, before it's too late for them. And Father, we do thank you for the lives here at Calvary Chapel over 36 and a half years of ministry. So many lives have been affected, perhaps more than we really have any idea of. And we ask, Lord, that you might continue to work Apart from you, we can do nothing. And the Holy Spirit, who is with all who are not yet saved, is the only one who can bring that conviction into their lives. We do stand together against the God of this world, who has blinded the minds of those who do not believe lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. And so, Lord, in the name of Christ, we ask, and in his authority, that you would open the eyes of the blind and cause them to have the ability to see that which at this time they are unable to see. And we pray, Lord, that they would repent and turn to you and be saved. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I did also want to just let you know that we're so looking forward to the new study coming up on Sunday afternoon, starting the 13th of July, the Slaying the Giants study. And um, I do want to pray again tonight just for a moment. The very first one, it's slaying the giant of fear. And you can see there in the bulletin, it says, in this lesson, we will learn how to overcome the debilitating effects of fear. Father, there are people that we probably have no idea of how afraid they are. And you know, Lord, and you tell, tell us over and over in fact, we just read about it in Luke 12 this last Sunday of who not to fear and who we ought to fear and why we need not be afraid. And so, Lord, we pray for people in our body who are overwhelmed by fear. And the fear as a giant has really just paralyzed them. We specifically pray for those people, and we ask, Lord, that you would extract them from that position through the Word of God and the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, if you'll stand with me, please, and open your Bibles to the uh, book of Ephesians, chapter 2, Ephes excuse me, chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3. 
And if you need a Bible, if you'll please just raise your hand up in the air, one of the ushers will be very, very happy to get a Bible for you. And I want to welcome um, those of you who may be viewing via the internet. We uh, are glad that you're able to join us, and we pray that the Lord will bless you abundantly. Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all people see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Well, Father, we say amen as well to this wonderful portion of your word, and we, along with Paul, ask that the same Holy Spirit that he was speaking of would this very evening work in each one of our lives according to your perfect will. Lord, you know our needs before we even bring them to you. And you're able, Lord, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, as we've just read, according to the power that works in us. And so, Lord, as we've gathered here tonight, we ask for your blessing. We pray, Lord, for the power of your Holy Spirit to work in such a way that Christ is honored and glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, Paul begins in chapter 3, verse 1, to actually pray. 
he doesn't get to his prayer till verse 14, because between verse 1 and verse 14, he begins to speak about the grace of God, and in particular, what he refers to over and over as the mystery. And he's been speaking about it a couple of times already in the letter, but he wants to speak about it at length, and he does. So in verse 1, he says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, and he really, and you'll see it as we get to the 14th verse, he was really wanting to start praying at that point, but he didn't. He began uh, a little bit later. But a couple of things that are worth noting before we get into the uh, chapter too much. He calls himself the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter. In fact, he wrote several of his letters. They're called the prison epistles. He was in the Mamertine prison in Rome. It is a testament to the fact that even though a person might be incarcerated and jail in that time period was nothing like jail is today, uh, it was basically a hole in the ground. I've actually had the privilege of visiting this particular area, the Mamertine prison, and uh, very difficult circumstances. And yet, as with all of what you read in the Bible, so often it's in the most difficult of circumstances in our lives that the Lord is able to bring something good out of them. And who would imagine that the Apostle Paul being uh, locked up in prison uh, would indeed be then inspired by God to write these letters. And so he was a prisoner of Jesus Christ, he says, for you Gentiles. And what he means by that is because he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, that salvation is a gift from God given on the basis of the grace of God received by faith and not by works, he was in jail. And the reason he was in jail is many Jewish Christians thought that Paul had really abandoned the God whom they worshipped and the God whom he had formerly worshipped in their own mind. And so they were persecuting Paul. They believed he was teaching false doctrine. Had Paul conceded to them that, yes, salvation is by faith in Christ and by keeping the law, he would have been in good graces with these people. But because he was uncompromising in his preaching, thus he suffered persecution. The Lord had called Paul, he had saved him and called him and given him his ministry, his mission. He defined it for him, for him very clearly. And Paul was faithful to do that which God had called him to do. In fact, he was faithful to do it all the way till his death. He kept the faith, he finished his course with joy, and then the Lord took him into heaven. And he's a model and an example for you and I of simply sticking with whatever it is that God has called you to do, even if it means great difficulty, and it will. If you choose to live godly in Christ Jesus, if you choose to be uncompromising in your life, you're seeking to say no to sin, and you're seeking to say yes to Jesus, then what happens is your life becomes more filled with the grace of God. There's fruit within your life. Your life becomes like a bright floodlight uh, in this world of darkness. And those who are in darkness are disturbed by the effect in them when they're with you. Light has a way of revealing. And when people have revealed to them the sin within their own life, they don't like it. 
uh, it's unpleasant. And uh, people love sin. That's why they keep sinning. Uh, they love darkness and they hate the light. And so uh, oftentimes when a person gets saved and they, they let their family know, they, they think, gosh, my family's going to be happy. I'm finally straightened out, only to find out that their family turns against them uh, because they've actually turned to Christ. And so Jesus prepared the apostles early on in his ministry. He said, these things I've spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And so when Paul said, I'm the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, he meant that just exactly as he said it. I'm in jail because I've been preaching the gospel, and I'm suffering greatly. And if you stick to your guns, you may not wind up in jail, uh, at least perhaps not anytime soon, but you may, who knows what will happen. But you will suffer for your faith in Jesus Christ. And um, better to suffer for obedience to Christ than to try to escape suffering and avoid it and run away from it uh, to fulfill your own pleasures and your own desires, you'll suffer in a greater way. You're going to suffer one way or the other. Better to suffer for the things of Jesus Christ. And so he identifies himself uh, just at this point in the letter. So he's wanting to pray, but uh, uh, he's so caught up in, in wanting them to tell them about his ministry to the Gentiles, the mystery, as he uh, mentions it. He says, in verse 2, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation or the stewardship of the grace of God which was given to me for you. He's reminding them uh, that he knew that they knew, but it's just a polite way of reminding them. He's saying to them, assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you, the Gentiles. And Paul is acknowledging here that he saw himself as a steward. He saw himself as someone whom God had entrusted a ministry to. And in his case, it was the stewardship of the grace of God which was given to him for the Gentiles. So Paul's ministry was to proclaim the grace of God, and he was to do it not to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. And we'll talk in a few moments about the extreme hatred between Jew and Gentile. It'll blow your mind. But the Lord chose this for him. The unmerited favor of God. And so wherever Paul went, he magnified the grace of God. And he explains a little bit now of how it is that this stewardship was given to him in verse 3. How that by revelation, he made known to me the mystery. And then you'll notice the little parentheses. As I wrote before in a few words, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So this mystery of Christ, which he's going to explain, was given to him by revelation. And in the New Testament, the word mystery isn't referring to something mysterious in the modern sense of the word, but it's referring to something unknown until it is revealed to the initiated. The mystery spoken of here is not that the Gentiles would be blessed, because that was predicted and prophesied in the Old Testament, as we've just been through the entire Old Testament. Many times God said he was going to reach out to the Gentiles. So the mystery wasn't that the Gentiles would be saved, but rather that the Gentiles would be equal heirs in one body in Christ. That's the mystery that God wasn't going to, uh, that God was going to do something very unique, both in the life of Jewish people 
and in the lives of non-Jews, bringing together one new man in Christ, and that both Jew and Gentile would be brought together in the same body on equal footing, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Nobody knew that. No one understood that. Had they understood that, Paul wouldn't have been persecuted. They would have said, oh yeah, we knew about this. But to the Jew, this was unheard of that a non-Jew would be on the same footing with them. And on top of that, these Gentiles weren't obeying the law like they were. So it was a great contention. So Paul says in verse 3, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So when the Father, when Jesus Christ called Paul, he took time with Paul, not only initially in his conversion experience, explaining to him, what he was going to do, but he took the time to reveal to him this mystery. So what Paul was preaching was something that God had revealed to him. It wasn't something that he had cooked up on his own. He hadn't figured this out. He uh, didn't concoct this message, but rather it was the truth of God centered in Jesus Christ and how the creator of the universe was going to take both Jew and Gentile and place them together in one body. Keep in mind, of all the nations in the world, God chose to work just through the nation of Israel. So they were very special. And by the way, God took the time in the Old Testament to explain to them, the reason I chose to work in you wasn't because you are special. He said, in fact, you're stiff-necked. You're a rebellious people. And he, he defined all of the bad things about them. But he said, the reason I chose you is because I happen to love you. And I'm sovereign and I can choose and do whatever I want. So you have to keep in mind out of all the nations, he chose the nation of Israel. He created it. And so God began to reveal to Paul that he was going to work now, in addition to the Jews, that he was going to work in the Gentiles just as he had worked in the Jewish people. And so he's giving credit to God here in this little parenthesis. He says, as I wrote before in a few words, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So he just wanted them to know a couple of things. First of all, this was something God had revealed to him. Number two, it was something that could be understood. If you read it, you can understand it. And number three, he wanted to make sure everybody understood that God is the one who receives the glory. You know, Paul was committed to living in such a way that God would be glorified. He understood very well that God does not want to share his glory with anybody and that he is the one to be glorified. And Paul had to learn this just like you and I did. Uh, though he was an apostle, he was also a man and he had to deal with pride and he had to learn the lessons of life that would humble him, but he was very committed to making sure that God got the credit for the things that happened in his life. And this is so important because the type of person whom God will use is the type of person who is aligned with the will of God and is committed to God getting the glory. This is why God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so we're told to humble ourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. You know, pride is a huge problem. I've read about it in books. It's a huge problem. 
It's something that God hates. He actually hates pride. Pride was the first sin when Lucifer was lifted up in pride. He was not content to be what God had made him to be and to function in the capacity that God had ordained for him. He wanted to be like God. And not being content and wanting to be the object of everyone's attention is something that all people have to deal with. I always like to say, well, if you don't believe you have a problem with pride, let me just show you that you do. Here's a picture, a group picture that was taken last week of you and a whole bunch of other people. You see this picture? And as you look at the picture, who do you think you're going to look for first when you look at the picture? You're going to be looking for yourself, aren't you? And we just, we're very, you know, um, we are our favorite subject to talk about. Self-love and pride. It's a, it's a big, big problem. And um, Paul here in verse 4, he says, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He says, you'll understand God is the one who revealed this to me. And he's always pointing them to Christ. He begins now to explain a little bit about the mystery. In verse 5, he says, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, and here it is, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. So the mystery in the previous ages was not known. No one understood that the church, which we so take for granted, would one day be composed of both Jews and Gentiles. Nobody even understood that there would be something called the church. But it, it was being revealed now, Paul says, as it has now been revealed. And notice who revealed it by the Spirit. And he revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. The church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. So the Holy Spirit of God took these men, these apostles, these prophets, and he personally revealed to them this truth which we don't even appreciate very much at all, uh, the wonderfulness of the church, of being in Christ. That the Gentiles, that you and I who are non-Jews, should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Let me just read to you a, a few sentences here regarding Jews and Gentiles and being fellow heirs. In the Holman New Testament commentary on Ephesians, Max Anders helps us understand why Paul repeatedly emphasizes the oneness of the body of Christ throughout this epistle. It's because Jews and Gentiles worshiping together was such a miracle. We simply do not understand the degree of separation that existed between these two groups of people, Anders writes. It is like saying there will no longer be blacks and whites in South Africa. Can you imagine that? It is like saying there will no longer be Catholics and Protestants in Ireland. It is like saying there will no longer be liberals and conservatives in the United States. Only conservatives. No, no, no. All these people are going to be made into one. 
In Paul's day, the animosity between Jew and Gentile was so strong that a Jewish woman would not help a Gentile woman deliver her child because the Jewish woman believed she was helping to bring another degraded human into the world. Jews would not even go through Samaria because it was a non-Jewish country. They would walk 150 miles out of their way around the border to keep from entering territory inhabited by a people they called dogs. So when the gospel offered grace to all, it produced a massive shift. Suddenly, there would be no separate Jewish church, no separate Gentile church. God had only one family, and Jew and Gentile alike had equal status. It was truly revolutionary, a revolutionary time in the church. So there in verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. And that's what you and I are as people who've come to Christ. We're fellow heirs along with the Jews. We're on equal footing with them. We're in the same body. God describes salvation in many ways. It's his fold, his sheepfold, his field, his house, his army, his family, his church, and his body. Christ is the head. And so God describes what it means to the saved person. We're, we're in the body of Christ. So we're of the same body, and we are partakers of his promise. This is a beautiful truth. You and I are partakers of the promise of God in Christ through the gospel. What is that promise of God in Christ through the gospel? The promise is whoever will believe in him will not be ashamed and will be saved. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You and I are partakers of that promise. As we've put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are saved. And he's made that promise to any and all, if whoever will call upon me. It's, the, it's his promise in Christ. It's not in your church or your pastor or your particular understanding of eschatology or any of that, you know, whatever you might get sidetracked on. It's in Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ. And it's through the gospel through the good news that Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. And so this is that mystery. And God especially revealed it to Paul. And Paul began to go everywhere he could, preaching the gospel and telling Gentiles that they could be saved just like the Jews could be saved. And this infuriated the Jews. It didn't infuriate the Gentiles, but it infuriated the Jews. They were so filled with pride. And Paul would get beaten up. He'd, they would have assassination uh, plots against him. He would be whipped, thrown in jail. I mean, he paid a very heavy price for being faithful to his calling. So he, is, he calls himself, first of all, a prisoner, there in verse 1, but in verse 7, he says, of which I became a minister. So he was a prisoner, but he was also a minister. So of which I became a minister or a servant, according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. So, both Jew and Gentile are part of the same body, and both enjoy the promise of blessings because we both belong to Jesus Christ. And what Paul is saying here in verse 7, 
He says, by God's grace and mighty power, and how gracious God is, how powerful he is. He says, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. That's how Paul viewed himself as a Christian. He realized that God had not only saved him, but that God had a calling upon his life, just like you, if you are saved, not only has God saved you, but he has a calling upon your life. It isn't just for the pastor or the people on staff. Uh, that, you know, that all has its place. But every member of the body of Christ has a calling. God has a calling for you. He's gifted you. You have spiritual gifts. He's uniquely created a plan for your life. And the beautiful thing is for the Christian, if they want to, and unfortunately so many don't want to, but if they want to, they can say, God, I really believe that you have something for me to do. And I don't know what it is, but I want to make myself available to you. So I'm surrendering my life to you, and I, I not only want to surrender my life to you, but I want to make a commitment to you. I want to put you first in every part of my life. And so this isn't something that I'm going to be thinking about, well, this week am I going to serve the Lord, or uh, what am I going to do this next week? It's a full-term, all-out commitment to Jesus Christ. That's normal Christian living. And when a person gets to the point in their Christian experience with God that they realize, yes, oh, this is what God has called me to. What a wonderful moment of understanding. And what a wonderful life it is to follow Jesus Christ in this way. Because it's, Jesus said... It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. You see, when you commit yourself to Jesus Christ in this way, you're saying, Lord, use my life to give through my life to other people. As compared to being a person who says, Lord, use everybody else to give to me. That is a miserable existence. The selfish person is the most miserable person in the world. The selfish person is, is never satisfied. They're always looking for more. The happiest people in the world are Christians who've determined to serve the Lord. And it's, it's very interesting that many people are deathly afraid to cross that line, I call it. I, I think of it as crossing a barrier. They're just afraid to really give themselves to Christ. I'm not really sure what they're afraid of, but I think they're basically afraid that life will be miserable if they just sacrifice everything for Jesus. I mean, you often hear people say, and it's very demeaning of God, it's bad information, it's unbiblical, and it's, uh, it's not encouraging people in the right way. They'll say, well, you know, uh, boy, if you really give yourself over to the Lord, you know what he's going to do, don't you? He's going to send you to the deepest, darkest part of the remotest part of the world. And it, it's as if they portray God who is just waiting for you to say, I'm available so he can say, oh, good, because I am now going to be able to make you miserable. I'm going to send you somewhere where you don't want to go. And people have this idea of God. You know, our Lord was sent from the Father. God gave his only begotten Son. He came from heaven to earth. And he said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. He's the model and he's the example of ministry. And then you hear Jesus all the time speaking about discipleship. He says, now if any man wants to be my disciple, 
He isn't laying out the requirements for salvation, but for discipleship, to be a learner. And he, and he realizes, you know, it's really up to you. It's your decision. This is what I'd like you to do. This is what I have for you. This is what would be best for you. But if any man wants to, if any man desires to be my disciple, then here's what you do. Pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Those are the requirements for discipleship. And the church is very vulnerable to the influences of their own flesh and of the world around them. And thus, it's easy for churches to become uh, like a country club where it's all about... Uh, uh, satisfying my needs, etc., etc., and the church really needs to guard against that selfish me first mentality and to really seek with all of their hearts to be normal Christians committed to Jesus Christ. And so Paul said, I became a minister. And he tells us that it was by God's grace, his mighty power, he says, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading the good news. And what a privilege it is. Oh, yes, it's hard. We've talked about all that, all of the persecution, all of that. That's part of it. But what a privilege it is to be a co-laborer with Jesus Christ. Can you think of any better way to spend your life, any better thing to make as the priority in your life than to know God and make him known? Can you think of anything more rewarding, more worthwhile in this world and in the world to come? You can't. And if you're holding yourself back from just surrendering to Christ, I urge you to really stop and think, why are you doing that? Your Lord or the Lord, who may not be your Lord, he may be your Savior, but not your Lord, the Lord is saying to you, look, if you desire to follow me, now can you think of anyone else worth following more than Jesus Christ? You can't. There's no one greater than him. Do you know that there's coming a day when every tongue will confess and every knee will bow? And I believe that's a particular moment in time. And when you think about every tongue and every knee, you're talking about all of the angels, both the wicked and the good, and all of the billions upon billions of people that have been created. What a gathering that will be when every tongue confesses and every knee bows that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What a, what a moment that'll be. And now in this life, you can have that same relationship with him. And this is why Paul in Romans chapter 12, he doesn't say I'm commanding you because God isn't commanding you to be a disciple. He's inviting you to be one. And Paul doesn't command. He said, I'm begging you. I'm urging you to present your body a living sacrifice to God. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Meaning, you'll be able to get right into the will of God personally. He says, I'm urging you to do it. I'm urging you by his mercies. Look what he's done for you. He shed his blood for you. He saved you. It's your only reasonable, logical thing to do. It's, it's, the, it's the proper thing to do. Yet it's up to you. What a privilege it is to serve the Lord. What a privilege it is to serve him. Paul looked at it that way. 
He says that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. There's no ending to the unsearchable riches of Christ. He goes on in verse 9, he says, And to make all people see what is the fellowship of the mystery. He, he wanted people to understand how God had worked through the Jews and was now working in the Gentiles to make all people see what is the fellowship or the, 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 uh, the sharing together of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. This is what Paul, he wanted everybody that he ran into to see this. I missed a verse, didn't I? Verse 8. You weren't paying attention. You should have said, hey, back to verse 8. He says, to me who am less than the least of all the saints. Now, I love that verse, because that's how Paul really thought about himself. To me, who am the least, I'm less than the least of all the saints. So there's the least of the saints. He said, I'm less than the least. Somebody says, how are you doing? You should say, well, I'm less than the least. They'll say, pardon me? Don't say that to them but you can understand it. Paul was a humble man. Imagine, this is what he, he wasn't just, uh, this wasn't PR work. This was what he really believed. I am less than the least of all the saints. He says, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all people see. This was his vision. This was his focus. What is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages all the way back into Genesis has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God, this was God's intention, that his manifold wisdom or his many-sided wisdom might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. The endless treasures. He says, I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. But then in verse 10, he says, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety, please notice, to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now, who's he talking about there? The angels. Do you know that the angels were told in Peter, they desire to look into these things? Do you know that even though they're there with God, some of them are here, but they're in some communication with God, coming and going, however all of that works, but even the angels who are there in the visible presence of God they don't understand all of the things that you and I do. They, they're very, very interested in the grace of God. This is why there's joy in the presence of the angels when one sinner turns and repents. And the angels in heaven are learning about grace as they look at the church. God, in bringing together Jew and Gentile, in one new man, one body, is teaching the angels all about the grace of God. And the devil himself is learning about it. And the demonic angels are also learning about it. And so the church is displaying the grace of God.
In verse 11, he says, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Think of that for just a moment, please. The eternal purpose. God has an eternal purpose for you. And he's accomplished it in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I love to stop and think about the reality of what's going to happen when we get to heaven and see the Lord and what has God got in mind for us? It's so delightful to sit with another Christian and just talk back and forth about the billions of galaxies and the billions of stars within each galaxy. The greatness of God and, and the wonders that he has planned for us. The eternal purpose. God has such a purpose for you and I. In verse 13, he asks and makes a request of the, the Ephesians. He says, therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. He's saying, look, please don't give up because I'm in jail. I mean, how would you feel if you heard your pastor got arrested for preaching the gospel? You, you might say, good, we're glad. No, no, you wouldn't say that. But um, you understand the point. He's saying, look, don't, don't lose heart for me. Don't be. In fact, I was reading in our one-year Bible when Paul was uh, with some folks there in Miletus. They were weeping and they were saying, oh, Paul, you're going to get in so much trouble if you go and do this and do that. And he said, why are you weeping? Why are you breaking my heart? He said, I'm ready not only to be imprisoned, but to die for Jesus Christ. He said, listen, we've got a different view going here. He said, don't break my heart with your tears. And now he's saying, don't lose heart. And, and this is a good thing for you and I to remember when a Christian is going through a great difficulty or a great trial. We can weep with those who weep and pray for them and comfort them, but never lose sight of the fact God has them in his hand. God is in control of their life. And, and so often we can say, oh, I'm just so sorry to hear about that. Well, we can be sorry in the sense that, it, yes, it's difficult, but look, God is in charge of that person's life. And the best thing we can do is try to help turn them back towards God if need be. And these people needed it. So finally, in verse 14, he gets to what he started to, to try to say in verse 1. For this reason, remember in verse 1, he said, for this reason, after now speaking, he said in verse 3, he said, I wrote before in a few words, he did tell fibs, didn't he? he are you with me? Ministers tell fibs about that. They'll say, well, now I've just got one last thing to say. They don't tell you that there's six parts to that last thing and, and they've got to get it all out. But he says, for this reason, so he's back to what he tried to start with. He said, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, all of this is why I actually bow my body before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. From whom, speaking of both the Father and the Son, he says in verse 15, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. We're in a family together. God has named us as his sons and his daughters. And now he begins to get into his prayer. He begins to focus in on praying for the Ephesians here. And I might just say that the secret to strong intercessory prayer is the focus of the prayer. So often when we pray, we look at our problems rather than looking at God. We grow discouraged and tired and unbelieving. It's all because our focus is wrong. When you pray, you need to glance at your problem and gaze on God. Many times when praying for others, we don't know how to pray or exactly what to pray for, 
But we, we learn from the Bible that it helps us to take the prayers of the Bible and make them our own. That doesn't mean we just recite what the Scripture says, but we can use what God teaches us in Scripture to be sure that we're praying the kind of prayer that the Holy Spirit will honor. That is especially true when you're praying for other people. Whether you're praying for your children, your spouse, your pastor, your fellowship group, or for friends that you want to influence for good, for God, and for eternity, you can take a prayer like the one we're going to read here in just a moment and use it as a guide. And this is why we put together every week these little prayer points. They're taken right from the, the message that you heard last Sunday. We actually list the verses, and anybody who takes the time to look at it can't deny the prayer request is taken right from the Scripture. And that's what strengthens us and gives us the ability to keep praying, is to pray according to God's will. So here's what his prayer consisted of, in verse, starting in verse 16, and I'm just going to get through this pretty rapidly. First of all, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, here it is, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. He was praying for the power of God to be given by the Holy Spirit in the inner man of the Christians there in Ephesus. You can pray that for yourself, that the Holy Spirit would give you power on the inside. You can pray that for me. You can pray that for your friends, your family, other believers. Lord, may the Holy Spirit give power to the inside of my friends or the person I'm praying for. The second thing he prayed for in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That word dwell there is a, a word that doesn't mean uh, just to hang out. The Lord, of course, is already with you. But what it means is that Christ would actually uh, be at home within your heart, that he would move in, settle down, and be at home. This is very important. Christ wants to be at home in your heart. He doesn't want there to be anything that's restricting his peace within you. But if you back up just a little bit, he's saying, I'm praying that God will give you power inside so that Christ can be at home in your heart. If you want Christ to be at home in your heart, then pray for God's power in your life. Ask the Holy Spirit to work in your life so that Jesus is welcome in your life. You don't have to do this on your own. So he prayed for power. He prayed that Christ would dwell in the hearts of the Ephesians, that Christ would be at home. That's a beautiful thing you and I can pray for. That in our church, that Jesus is at home in, the, in our lives. Now what's the opposite of somebody being at home? Well, there's, there's a restriction. There's a restlessness. There's a prohibition. Uh, you can't come into this room. You can't go into that room. Uh, this is off, bound, off limits to you. This is out of bounds. You know, I think of my, my life and my heart and your heart as just like a, a square. And, and, you know, things tend to hide in corners. And I, and, and I ask the Lord, Lord, go and just, you know, sweep out into the corners of my life darkness and sin and get it out of my life. I want it to be out of my life. I don't want to have any darkness in my life. I want to be open to you, completely at peace with you and you at peace with me. And I don't have to depend on myself for that to happen. I can ask the Holy Spirit to give me power. Now, what happens once Jesus is at home in your hearts? Well, notice in the last part of verse 17, that you being rooted and grounded in love. You see, when Jesus is able to be at home in your life, it's going to cause you to become rooted and grounded in the love of God. 
So if, if we're not walking in love, then we need to back up and say, well, there's something amiss in my relationship with Christ. And we can back up even further and say, well, Holy Spirit, would you please work in my life so that there isn't anything amiss with me in Christ, so that Christ is able to ground me and root me in the love of God. This is who God is. God is love. You're his child. He wants to reproduce himself in you. There's nothing more powerful to witness to other people than the love of Christ. And then the next thing he prays for, he says uh, there in verse 18, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And so Paul uses four dimensions here to describe the immensity of God's love. He speaks of its breath, which reminds us that his arms reach around the whole world. That speaks of missions. On the cross, Jesus' hands were stretched out for the whole world. He speaks of its length, which reminds us that his love extends from eternity past to eternity future. It existed before the foundation of the world and will exist after the world's end. Its depth reminds us that his love addresses the deepest needs of the human heart. God loves sinners no matter who they are. And no matter what they have done or where they have been. And its height, it reaches to the very throne of God. Out of love, Jesus came down from heaven and lifts up to his level anyone who chooses to believe. Because no one can climb up to his. We have to be lifted up by Christ. And we've been seated in the heavenly places with him. Well, he, he ends this portion of the letter here in verse 20 and 21 with praising God. So he's, he's prayed several things, four things really. It's worth taking the time to look at that prayer and turn it into your own prayer for yourself, for your friends, and, and so on and so forth. But then he says in verse 20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. All the glory goes to God, he's saying. All glory to God. And he, He's saying, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. God is able to do so much more than we can ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout or through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Imagine this. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that, that really resides in us. That's a, a tremendous truth about God. No prayer that you can ever ask can exceed God's power. Imagine that. No prayer that you can ever ask can exceed God's power, but many times his plans exceed our petitions. He has greater things in mind. And Paul ends here by asking that God would be given glory through the church, and may God be given glory through you and I. Well, let's have the ushers come on up, please, and we're going to receive the tithes and the offerings. There's a note in your bulletin there quoting a portion of Malachi 3.10. It says, 
Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you so much for our time in the word and the encouragement, the exhortation, the things that you've said to each one of us, the promptings from your word in our lives, the recognition, Lord, in our lives of maybe a rebellion or stubbornness or where we're holding back from you, but then also the recognition, oh God, yes, I want to be like that. Well, Lord, we want to just present ourselves to you tonight and we pray for an infusion of the power of the Holy Spirit within our lives. We desire that Jesus would be at home within us, Lord. No restrictions. And thus, Lord, we want to repent of any sin in our lives. And, oh, Lord, how easily sin can take hold of us. We want to turn away from it and turn to you. And, Lord, we bring to you now this, these tithes, these offerings, as those who love you and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.